Last week on part one of Open Mic with Ricky Nixon. Your marriage, your business, your assets, your reputation, your dignity, yep. all gone. You know, I've got a, a lot to make up, particularly to my two boys and my wife. What did happen? You were flying for such a long time and then just this spiral that's taken you to places, dark places. Everything gets reported about me is only from one side. You said that you had inappropriate dealings with the 17-year-old girl. Because I was drugged in a hotel room. Self-administered or, or inflicted upon you? Inflicted upon me. Was this a drug-induced stupor for 10 days, was it? It was more a breakdown. I was at mm. the point where I was actually a totally broken person. Were you addicted? If it affects your work or it affects your personal life, you're addicted. Okay. And in the end it did, so okay. I was addicted. When do you think it all started in terms of your antisocial behaviour? Was it, I remember the famous collision. You were driving down Swan Street in Richmond. A tram has uh, stopped in front of you and you cannon into the back of it. That, to me, seemed to be the first time that you came to public attention. Is that... Yeah, well, I mean, as much as everyone would love to connect it to the whole downward spiral, it actually was a one-off situation. I, the people used to... My officers were at Etihad, Etihad Stadium and Ian Collins and the parking guys there used to laugh how often my car was there because I would never drive with a drink. But that night on the way home, I had been drinking. I actually left the office to get a taxi, changed my mind. I wouldn't be the first person in Australia to do that. The biggest mistake I, I made on, that, on the way home was I decided to get on a tram and just forgot to get out of my car. <laughs> first, Mike. Oh, I shouldn't laugh, but that is funny. <laughs> perhaps you Mark, have got a future, got a smile in, a little perhaps bit you've got more, a future in comedy. I'm but but uh, the, you left out one um, vital ingredient in that uh, assessment. Yep. You were 0.108. Yes. Which is more than twice the legal limit. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not, the luck factor disappears, doesn't it? Oh, look, Mike, I 100% agree with the people who say you could have killed someone. Mm. I mean, I'm not here to... Whilst I'm laughing about it a bit, I'm laughing, trying to laugh at myself, but at the same time, it's a very serious matter, and I understand that, and people shouldn't be in a car driving whilst over the limit. Mm. Um, Were you on the phone? That, that when I was on the phone to Ireland actually and it was raining and I looked up and I was on the tram tracks behind the tram and skidded on the tram tracks and ended up under it. There was a lot of people on the tram, they all got off, there was a big commotion, a guy came out and said, Ricky, um, I, I exchanged my name and address with the tram mm -hmm. driver yep. and yep. Um, a guy said, Ricky, I think it might be best if you get in a taxi and get home. Of course, that was reported that I left the scene of the accident. I didn't leave the scene of the accident. Well, I did, but not as in deliberately or maliciously or I checked if anyone was injured. You'd actually have to think that in a 40-tonne tram there wouldn't be too many injured people with my little mm. Alfa Romeo sliding under the back of it. So once again, I felt it was the start of a fair bit of misreporting about me, to be honest. Yeah, although I'm not quite sure, I don't want to, I'm not going to dwell on this one, but where's the misreporting in there? You're 0.108, uh, you're fleeting, driving to the back of the tram. The scene, the scene well, of the you accident. did go before the police arrived, did you not? Big pardon? You did leave before the police arrived. Uh, yes. Yeah. But if you, if you, if I say to you that I didn't know that I was 0.1, mm. I might have been 0.04. Mm. I exchanged my, okay. my driver's okay. licence yeah. with the tram, but Mike, you don't like to hear. What I no, no, I'm happy, to, I'm happy for you to give that side of the story. And you said before that the media hasn't allowed yeah. you to give the others, to put some balance no. in this debate. I mean, that, that's a subjective assessment. But I, I accept that because you're the one who's been targeted with the front page stories and the, and the bad headlines. Yeah. I understand that. The decision to go to rehab, you went to rehab up on the Gold yep. Coast. Uh, was that yours alone or how did that come about? No, there was an incident with my girlfriend, which I'll regret for the rest of my life. Um, this is Tegan something, we're talking Something I've about. never been involved in, yes in my life and um, you know if I had my time again well I can't have my time again no. um, but I'm make, working hard to make sure that never happens again um, and I'm not going to go into it because there was only two people there and they those two people know what happened. This was an incident though that led to police intervention yes, didn't it? police intervention yeah. and, and a court um, case. A court case and also a year of dealing with the police who, who probably could see my side of the story as well. I don't mean um, my side of the story of necessarily what happened that night but what I was going through as a person and I appreciate the way the police have dealt with me in the last probably 18 months. To be honest they probably helped me get out of a lot of the trouble I was in. I don't mean legal trouble but the actual hell I was in mm. mentally. So what happened was I rang my GP and said, actually I'll take it back one step. It was front page of the newspaper again and I got a phone call from Peter well, What Moore. was the front page of the front newspaper? The front page was Nixon faces jail. Okay. Yeah. I can remember the headline yeah. and I'm like what? That's not what happened you know. And this, leaving is the, this is the altercation with your then girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. The um, the uh, the phone rang, and it was Peter Moore, 
Collingwood mm -hmm. star and Brownlow Meadows, who was a good friend and helped coach at football. And I think Peter's seen over a period of a few years leading up to this the decline in me, to be honest. And he said, Rick, I don't, know, I don't, don't want to know what happened. I don't care what happened. All I know is your front page of the newspaper again, and this can't continue. And that was the intervention or the turning point. Okay, okay. And I rang my GP and I, I um, remember I was driving to Cranbourne and he, uh, he, I was on the phone to him and he said, we've got to do something. I, I, I want, you've got to get out of the environment. That's the first point. So I made a decision, I've got to get away from the shit. How can you help me to my GP? And he said, there's this place on the Gold Coast, Corumban Clinic, it's for mental health and addictions. And I said, that's me. He said, well, it's not you because it's $30,000 to go there. Wow. Have you got $30,000? For I what said, period? A month. And I said, no, I haven't. Um, but he said, have you got private health insurance? I've gone, oh, hmm. I bloody stopped paying it, you know, like months ago. And I don't know why, but I um, sort of drove along a little bit more going, how am I going? I might have to go to some mates who have got a bit of money or whatever. And I rang my wife, Jude, and I said, um, this is the plan. And, and uh, also what I need to do, but I haven't got any money and I haven't got any health insurance. She goes, you have. I said, no, I haven't. She goes, yes, you have. I've been paying your health insurance for the last year because I knew this day was coming. And I, I just pulled over on the side of the road and I, I don't want to sound dramatic too much, but I just couldn't stop crying. Yeah, I can understand that. And I, um, I didn't know what to do. And I, after I turned the car around and headed back to Port Melbourne, I, um, I, I decided to go and see her and my son Mitch, who was living with her in Camberwell. And on the way, I rang Lewis, my, my um, uh, son, who was on the Gold Coast at Bond Union. I said, I've decided to make the decision that everyone can't, a lot of people can't mm. make, the first step. And I'm gonna do this, Lewis. And he said, Dad, whatever it takes, I'm gonna come and see you every day and hold your hand. Oh my God. Anyway, I got to Jude's house and we were sort of having a chat. And Mitch- Jude's house that used to be your house. Yeah, yeah, well, no, yeah. new house in Campbell. Okay. And, um, yeah. and it, you know, it was very quiet, it's fair to say. And Mitch hadn't spoken for nearly a year. I mean, he refused to deal with any of this, and I can understand that. And he had his head down, and Jude was there, and she's sort of trying to ask me encouragingly, you know, what, what's Corumban about? And I said, look, Jude, if there's anything I can do for you, what is it? And she said, how long are you going for? I said, I'm going for a month. She said, if you come back early, I'll kill you. Mm. And I said... I went to she said, no, you listen for once. I know what you're like. You'll think you're cured in two minutes. And I, do, I would do that. Oh. And I turned to Mitch and he had his head down. And um, I said, Mitch, what, what do you want me to do, mate? And he, um, he wouldn't look up. And I said, Mitch, what do you want me to do? And um, you know, this, this will live with me for a long time. He um, looked up and he just said, you know what? I just want my dad back. That's all I, I just want my dad back. Gee. And I went, fuck. And I got in the car and I drove around the corner and it was a bad day. I just like, just, I couldn't drive. But it might've been the day that saved your life. It saved my life. There's been other bridges and everything, but my son saying he just wanted his dad back. When I go running every morning, I think about Lewis and Mitch and I say, they don't deserve any of this. Wow. And uh, I'll, I'll do it for them. They've been pretty resilient, your family. They are, I'm very proud of the whole three of them. Mm. Well, from my wife to, um, um, my two sons who, not once has my wife spoken to the media, ever. She doesn't seek attention like other females do. She doesn't say anything about any of this. She deserves all the credit. She's a great mum. But then I, I, and, I, and I accept all of that, but how could you have treated her the way you did with all the, the, the humiliation and shame that she's had to sort of suffer because of what you've done? It's terrible. Terrible, Mike. Hmm. But Mike, I can do one of two things and the choice is this, connect myself or I can do something about it. Mm. And what I'm gonna do is try and make her as happy as I can within you know, the, the confines of what I can do. And, and I know what will make her happy, and that's seeing our two sons happy. Yeah. And, and seeing Mitch now talk, and the yeah. fact that with my new business, Mitch is interested in coming in and being a sports agent. What is your new business, Ricky? Uh, well, I, I probably for three years hated football. I couldn't even go and watch it. it, it you know, just. For, I shouldn't be blaming football for what happened to me, but I have been in it for 30 years. And it's been a hard last 20 years. The management is not what everyone thinks it is. You know, constant seven day a week phone mm. calls and do, and it's always to fix people's mm. problems. The only problem I couldn't fix was the big knob sitting in my office, me. Yeah. It, it's hard to keep a person with as much adrenaline down, but I, I just had to calm down. I got on some medication called Epilim 
and it did do a, it's for epilepsy but it does calm you down and I was then able to make good decisions so when I got to Christmas I decided I would make a decision about whether to go back into what I love and do best and that's sports management and so flying start will rise from the ashes really and same name same same yes. theme and um with the support of a couple of pretty close friends, um, Peter O'Shea and Bill McNee and Matt Tripp, um, encouraging me and helping me in a few ways. And um, Peter's son, Greg O'Shea, has come in as a, a, a agent who I'm gonna train up. And to my surprise, Mitch actually responded well to wanting to be involved, and so, so did So your Lewis. son's gonna work with you? Yeah, so Mitch yeah. more probably as a, a sports agent, hopefully down the track, and, and Lewis, who's studying film and television, God forbid, um, <laughs> might do a documentary on me one day. So, <laughs> so you know, it, it, it does lift you when you're down and out, and, and it's partly my agenda going forward is, is always been to help people, um, but with you've gotta help yourself first, Correct. Mike. And my biggest change in my attitude since September is, Number one has to be yourself. If you get yourself fit and healthy, you then can help the other people better. But I felt during the Ben Cousins period, I can always remember Mark Robinson saying to me, why are you, why are you going to this degree to help him? Mm. Just let it go. Just if he's going to crash into a wall, let him crash. I'm like, no, 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 no. Stuff were you, were you, did you feel, though, that you were kindred spirits with, with Benny? I now look back and now think it was about one thing, and that was I was in a bad way, and I felt by helping Ben, I was feeling good about myself, mm. and by, you know, d going to the nth degree, I'd get an adrenaline rush. You, you mentioned Ben Cousins. You've, you've had some massive names in football. I remember Club 10 had the biggest names in the game. Probably three of the biggest names, Cousins, Wayne Carey, Gary Ablett Sr. You had all of those blokes under your care, all of them went off the rails at different times in different ways. Yep. Do you feel any culpability about that? Um, I would say culpability. Do you feel some responsibility for it in a certain way? But let's just keep in mind and keep it in context that they employ me to do their football contract, not to wipe their bum 24-7. And if I can just leave this with people to think about, they spend six to seven days a week at a footy club for anywhere between three and nine hours a day I would see Wayne Carey or Ben Cousins probably once every two or three weeks for half an hour for a coffee. Is that all? Well, did, well, well you might see in daily a, good, a good player like a Wayne Carey, you might see every cut, depending on the time of the year. But am I responsible because Wayne Jay walked last week um, or did anything else? I mean, I think it's drawn a long bow, to be honest. Um, okay. Yeah, that's my answer. The fact that you are no longer Ricky Nixon running Flying Start must have cost you a lot of money in the past yeah. four or five years. Yeah, I mean, do you, you have any idea? It's cost me in excess of four million. Yeah, um, that, is that, that in revenue or in, in, in net income? Well, assets and cash at bank. Yeah. What you can say what you like. I mean, you know, I've got nothing. You, you're and, penniless, um, are you? I'm penniless. So the house in Kew's gone. Yep. The house at Point Lunsdale's yep. gone. You but, work out what three years of legal battles cost yeah. you, and um, you know, separations, divorce. You go on. Are you you're not divorced, are you? I'm divorced. You are divorced. Yeah. Okay. I suspect there's a few people that you'd be disappointed in that they may have turned their back on you mm. in the past few years. Has there anyone surprised you in the other way that's come to your aid? <laughs> um, look, you know, I'd have to say that Matthew Richardson and Nick Rewald and David King, who we saw out here, David's taken me out for coffee several times. Um, I don't want anyone to feel guilty that, oh, I didn't ring Ricky or go and see mm. him. I don't, I don't hold any grudges that way. Um, there's a couple that could have been a bit more supportive, I felt, but... I'm over that now too. I, I've also had players stop me in the street of late and go, oh, Ricky, I was too embarrassed to tell you that we stuffed this up. You know, we walked away from you after you did everything for me for 10 years. The minute something happened to you, I walked away because the club told me to, mm. or it was in the papers, or I didn't want to be associated mm. with it. If you told me that two years ago, I would have just about knocked the player out for not supporting mm. me. But now I go, you know what, mate, though? I would have done the same. But the fact you've had the balls to come up to me now and put your arm around me and say, mate, I'm wrapped at you, um, you know, got your son on board and you're up and about, that's great. And Sam Newman, um, of all people, who's been very supportive of me and helped me a lot when the, the shit hit the fan early days, said, if you're a friend of someone's, a true friend, you're a friend for life. You don't have to agree with what they've done and it might be illegal, but you should be there to support them. And Sam was there and so was Eddie in, when, when the, a lot of the shit at the fan and, um, you know, some other people ran, I'll be honest. You know, some people who who I, I think I've given a lot of support to over 20 or 30 years, particularly 
in the AFL industry ran. And now, because they can see me back up again, it's uh, starting to ring and it's like, well, <laughs> see you, brother. Wayne Carey of late has been fantastic to me. Um, Did you fall out with Wayne? Uh, Wayne, Wayne and I, I wouldn't say ever fell out as in, um, we fell out over uh, when he went to Adelaide, to be honest. But Wayne, everyone always asks me about Wayne. What's Wayne like? I'd say Wayne's the most loyal bloke I've ever met in my life. I think he's a fantastic bloke. Yes, he's had his problems and stuffed up and so have I and so have most people watching this show would have stuffed up at some stage yeah. in their life yeah. too. It's just they're not front page of the newspaper. And I used to say to a lot of people that, you know, if I could pick the worst thing you've ever done in your life that no one knows about and we put it on front page of the Herald Sun tomorrow, how would you feel? And they all go, yeah, not too bloody good. Mm. You, you do, even though you and Wayne have this... Uh, abiding loyalty to each other. There have been, it's been, had ups and downs over this relationship, hasn't it? Uh, we've punched on. Punched, you know? literally punched on? Nearly. Was there, a, was there an incident in your office one day where someone needed to get between you? And you were fighting out of your, <laughs> out of your league too, if you did that. It was quite funny because Todd Viney was working for me and um, Wayne, I can't remember what it was over, but Wayne said, get stuff basically. And, rah, 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 and I said, no, you'll do what I tell you to do thinking, oh, God, I hope he doesn't stand up. And he stood up and, and he basically leaned across him and I think he was about to go whack. And Todd grabbed him and said, sit down, Wayne. And Wayne actually went, well, oh, maybe the two of them. Mm. It would have been <laughs> and, a and when we scrap. walked out, Todd said to me, thank Christ, he didn't swipe back. We both <laughs> would have been dead. So it was actually quite a funny moment. But, yeah, he's been... Look, Wayne's a guy, as far as I'm concerned, he's the greatest player who's ever played by a long, long way. Well, we agree, yeah, we agree on that. But, that. but I'm talking about more the personal relationship. I mean, the, the, the celebrated, what's well, not celebrated, the notorious event of the, the first uh, decade of the 21st century, Kerry leaves North Melbourne. Yeah. Um, now, you were central to that. You called the press conference, you counselled him. Uh, that must have been a traumatic period, was it? Well, you know, we talk about the Clinton Gribes impact on me and, you know, probably you bring it up today. Well, have a look at that, Ricky. Just... That, there's there's the, the headline of the day yeah. uh, when the Herald Sun sales went up, I think from memory, about 60,000 that day. Yeah. Kerry leaving Arden Street. And you were pivotal in that. Yep. Well, it's one of those things that as much as probably Wayne doesn't, wouldn't like to see that, unfortunately for the rest of his life he is, and, and I'm going to see the headlines about me. And I, and I now cancel my two sons about that, that we've got to understand that it's going to always come up now. In your book, It's a Jungle Out There, which you wrote in 2010, Sally Carey said uh, when the North Melbourne thing blew up with, with Wayne and with Anthony Stevens, Sally Carey said that North Melbourne, his teammates, you as his manager and she as his wife, had all let him get away with murder yep. and that precipitated that explosion. Is that... Is that a fair comment? Um, it's a comment that's stuck with me for a long time and um, you mentioning it again today um, in my head brings it all up again. And um, um, I can totally understand her saying that, absolutely understand her saying that because we put sports people and high profile people on this pedestal they don't deserve to be on, but we do it. Why? Because we love sport and we love, our, we love to um, hero worship people. You and I had a discussion recently um, and I thought something happened that just set you off and you said all they ever wanted, this is the players, all they ever wanted was there was want, want, want. And it seemed like you were actually sort of venting about how you had been sucked dry by, by all these people that you looked after. I think it's just more a case of these days is, is the younger generation is want, want, want. It's, it's very rare for me to hear someone say thank you. Social media, you like it, don't you? You know, uh, you were talking before about keeping your head down, flying yeah. under the radar. But aren't you prolific on social media? I enjoy it. Um, yeah. Apparently, you're not allowed to enjoy your life, Mike. No, no, I didn't I say had, that. Um, I'm just talking about you saying that you wanted to say maybe be off the pace for a while. Look, unfortunately, I'm one of those people who, um, when people say don't, I do. <laughs> and if I can't, I can. Um, I enjoy it because I'll tell you why. I don't have a family that live with me. I live on my own. And it's my family, the people who are on my Facebook. Maybe they'll go and see you at uh, the comedy club and other places where you uh, do your comedy act. How's well, that I think going? The, the, the criticism, the double page spread I copped saying how unfunny I was and mm. it was a disgrace I was doing comedy and I hadn't actually done a show, <laughs> it was mind blowing um, back in March last year. Um, the fact that the two shows I did were sellouts to 400 people. I mean, Dave Hughes told me the first show he did was 15 people in Ballarat and they booed him off stage. He's been mm. pretty successful mm. since then. And Dave, of all people, in all honesty, was supportive and just said, 
you'll get criticised a lot more than everyone else. So head down, bum up, mate. You are you are pretty funny if you just do it your yeah, way. I was going to ask you that. No, I don't. I think I'm funny, but no one else does. Do yeah. you think you're funny? Well, you've got that right, Mike. But um, <laughs> um, I think that I've learnt to be funny, and I think that well, I don't think it is part of my story, and that. I want people to know why I do the comedy. It's not because I want to be a full-time comedian. It's because my grandmother in her 90s um, was concerned about me three years ago and basically said, come and see me and Benny, I need to see you. And I went to the retirement home and she was quite funny. She said, oh, just get me out of this joint. There's too many old people in here. <laughs> and I started laughing and she said, that's what I want you to do every day. I want you to laugh every day. I don't care what you do to do it. And I started to get laughs on Facebook and, I, and it was making me feel happy and laugh. And I went, hey, this is a better life than standing on bridges in London. Mm. What's the uh, origin of and the meaning of toot toot, toot toot or whatever you call it? Um, the, the background is when I was on Twitter and I was getting hate, which a lot of people do. And we've seen that with a person recently who's passed away because she got so much hate on Twitter. I think it's disgraceful that the government doesn't legislate users of social media, to be honest. But um, the origin was, uh, my nickname's always been Chicken. Mm -hmm. For 20 years, I was called Chicken at Carlton when I was 17 or 18, and um, it was Chicken Lips because I got a small yep. mouth. And um, someone started calling me the Chicken Train. And then someone said, all aboard the Chicken Train. And I replied, toot toot. I don't know what I did to this day, but bloody hell, it's taken off around Australia. And I, I sort of, people say, what's it mean? And I say, it doesn't mean anything. Like, I'll say toot toot to a photo and it might be an approval. This will surprise you, but I'm going to talk about Ricky Nixon, the footballer. Well, this will be a very long story, Mike. Well, about you're, three seconds. you're 11 years, 11 seasons in the AFL, playing with Carlton, St Kilda and Hawthorne yep. for 63 games. Yep. 55 of those games were with the Saints. 62 good ones, Mike. 62 good ones. Yeah. Well done. Um, you had some good, uh, St Kilda was a pretty good team when you were there. In 1991, I reckon St Kilda was nearly the best team in the competition. Yeah, look, in 91, Ken Sheldon was in as coach and um, he was going really well. He was a great guy to be able to gel a club that was very disjointed when I went there. When I went there, they were the worst team I'd ever seen in my life. You've got to remember, I've come from Carlton and won three premierships in four years. The roar that day at Waverley when we played Geelong, it was probably... Without a doubt, the most exciting game I've played in. That was your. Um, you, that was a, a f first an elimination final. Your first senior game for the year, correct? Yeah, I, I'd been injured all year. I had bad hamstring problems, and um, uh, for them to take the punt and play me, the idea was I was probably going to play about a quarter and a half late in the game, and hopefully go forward and kick kick a goal or goals to help us win. We'd beaten Hawthorne twice that year by a fairly sizable amount of points and um, they couldn't hold the plug out, they just couldn't stop him. We were very confident if we got over Geelong that we, we could go all the way. Um, Plugger kicked I think nine or so and Brownless kicked seven or something that Today, day. Yeah. We yeah. went down by about a goal. In the end we was, what cost us was, I cost us and so did um, whoever else was on the bench because in the first quarter Nathan Burke and David Grant got knocked out or, or injured and we had to come on in the first quarter. Mm. You played with Plugger yeah. and you managed Wayne Carey. And you've said Kerry's the best player you've seen by a long way. Plugger must be up there, is he? Plugger was exceptional. Like just, I just remember you just bomb the ball in his direction, he'd just mark it or get it. He was a great kick for goal. But I did say to him one day, um, I'd like to see how you go at full back for a, for a full game. <laughs> he laughed and he said, oh, it wouldn't be any good. But he was an extraordinary character in that he just didn't worry about too much in footy. He didn't know who he was playing on this week. He didn't even know who we were playing that week. But he's... he's just a bloke who loved his footy. He's a country kid and, you know, he's, he's going to be a legend in the game, isn't he? Gary Ablett Senior. Yep. Many say the best player that's ever played the game. He says he is. Yeah, and I think he does say that because Gary <laughs> Ablett Junior always says that. Okay. You, you, um, you had a major influence in his life for, for an extended period. Um, was, how, tell us how, how that evolved. No, I think he had a major influence on me, to be honest, about my whole management. People would probably say, how would that be? He asked me to go fishing with him one day. And I went out, I'm like, why are we going fishing? He goes, because I want to talk to you. So we went out fishing. And I realised only days after we went fishing that that was, that was how to talk to Gary because we were on a boat on our own with no one else around. And he said the words to the effect of, 
Rick, I don't want to do what everyone else wants me to do. I just want to be Gary Ablett. Mm. And that, that had a profound effect on me that here we are wanting, just because Gary's one of the greatest players of all time and he would say the greatest, I say second greatest, he, just because we want him to be a footy show host or a, you know, and he wrote a newspaper column, he doesn't want to be that. Mm. And I went, good on you, mate. Are you in the clear? Do you see yourself now as being at risk at all? Absolutely, yep. I think you fool yourself if you think you're in the clear on anything. Drinking, alcohol, depression, anxiety, it's just something that you've got to live with the rest of your life. It's how you manage it and how you act and how you, you uh, respond to when it's put in front of you. Mm. I'd be lying to you if I said in the last few weeks I haven't seen drugs in front of me somewhere. At ho oh, you go to any hotel now, drugs are everywhere. Mm. We have stopped, we've got to stop burying our heads in the sand about this whole ice epidemic that's around Australia and every city now. Every headline just about now on the news every night is about a murder, um, people running into houses, bashing people, older people being killed. It's all because of one thing. Let's stop being stupid about it. It's not alcohol, it's ice. And it's going to destroy the world unless we do something wow. about it. Wow. You said, I asked you before uh, how long you've been off illicit substances, yep. cocaine, whatever, whatever yep. it is. Uh, you said you can't remember. D is that true? You, you my, must know the last time that you... My that answer you... is this, Mike, is it's nobody's bloody business. I can't recall. That's you my can't answer. recall? No, I can't recall. I don't think it's anyone's business, to be honest. Every time I make a statement about something, it's the next headline. So, you know, do I want everyone looking up my backside tomorrow about where I was last week or who I was associating with? No, I don't. So okay. get another life media and all the public. <laughs> Guess what? Take your opinion somewhere else because I really don't give two hoots about them. Is there one moment, one event, one day that you would love to have over again? Yeah, I wouldn't have pushed the bloody lift button in that hotel room, Mike. Mm. I wished I'd never done it, but I can't change it. You know, no. The lift went up. Imagine if it didn't, if it'd just been faulty that day. None of this would have happened. You would have gone up the stairs, wouldn't you? Probably. Mm. Yeah, probably. But, you know, we can't change it, so we're going to move on. And, you know, without harping on it, my sons are all it's about these days and you know i'll keep doing the right thing for them okay hey mate you've been remarkably candid um it's been a long time in the making this interview about eight months but i admire your candor i think you're going in the right direction uh, you look well and uh we wish you all the best for the future thanks thanks Ricky. mike and don't forget toot toot <laughs> This has been a Fox Footy production for Fox Sports. 